So the instructions for the evening, we are going to have, uh, we have questions that we've already presented, and you will have three minutes to answer the question. Um, Robert will be, Luis will be giving the time, and I will say time, and Mr. Terry will move on to the next candidate. The questions are going to work this way. We'll start with Ms. Ampion. Uh, first question, everyone answers the second question with um, Councilman Bernal, and that's how it will go, if, if that makes sense to you. Okay. Um, I think that's about it. Our moderator, I'd like to introduce Wayne Terry, he's with HED. He also is our chairman of the board. And he will be <laughs> so if everybody is ready, we will begin our forum. <laughs> One additional point, uh, time permitting, we will have questions from the floor after all the questions are asked. Our first question will go to you, Ms. Aguillon. What qualifications do you bring to the Texas House District 123 race? Okay, well, Melissa Aguillon, I'm a, a small business owner. I've had my own business for five years, Aguillon & Associates. We're a public relations marketing firm. I have 20 years experience career-wise here in San Antonio, both in the public sector and in the private sector. I have my undergraduate degree from UTSA as well as my master's in public administration. And uh, I have a, throughout, throughout those 20 years, have developed a very good reputation. I have a lot of friends uh, who, who, people that I've worked with on different levels that I can now actually call friends, but that I can call on whenever I need to get something done. And um, obviously working, uh, towards being a state representative in this district, I look forward to uh, serving the community at a deeper level. I've always been very involved in community service and have served on the UTSA alumni board. I've served on the Hispanic Chamber Board of Directors, and I've also served um, on the San Antonio Association of Hispanic Journalists. So I work uh, promoting other small businesses, such as yourselves, helping nonprofits, and I'm very excited about uh, working with uh, the constituents of District 123. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, my name is Guillermo Renal. Uh, first, on the life side, I, I grew up in this district. I went to school in this district. Uh, after I, I went away for college at the University of Michigan, where I got my undergraduate, my master's, my law degree, and I came back and moved back into my old neighborhood. Uh, most of my friends or friends I've had all my life, and so I feel like I'm rooted in the community. I think a lot of people expect me to say that being elected previously, being the District 1 council person, which is about 65 or 70 percent of 123, is what qualifies me to do the job, but that's really not the case. I think we all know plenty of elected folks who have been elected, they've had people vote for them, but they haven't done much there, so that's not my answer. My answer is on the issues of public education, on the issue of predatory lending, on the issue of civil rights, on the issue of health care, I've had experience with those issues. I litigated school finance cases before. In fact, the lawsuit that just came out a while back, I worked on the last version of that lawsuit, the school finance lawsuit, in 2004 and 5. Uh, I went hard after the payday lending. It was the strongest payday lending regulations in the entire state, but we needed to take that to the state level. I've done work with healthcare. So my qualifications are not that I've had people vote for me, I've been on a ballot and won an election. That's not really a qualification, that's an experience. But I believe that I have the experience with the issues we're going to deal with in Austin. That is what makes me uniquely qualified uh, for this position. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Paul Ingenson, and I'm running for District 123 State Representative. In terms of qualifications, I have a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. I've been a resident for District 123 for over 30 years. Uh, my background in clinical psychology, some would probably say that uh, somebody with expertise in mental health would play an important role in the state legislature uh, for various reasons. Uh, beyond that, I think that the analytic skills that I've acquired in my training are going to help me uh, analyze the documents and the uh, data that is necessary to digest complex data sets and translate them into policies that can help people's lives. In my work uh, as a clinical psychologist and as a sleep medicine expert, I have uh, 
worked in both the public and the private sector. I have helped people uh, who are well insured. I have helped indigent homeless people. I think the breadth of experience that I have in dealing with many sectors of our community and recognizing those unmet needs uh, suits me well uh, to take a position of leadership in representing the interests of the people of District 123. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Walter Martinez, and I too am a native of San Antonio, and not only San Antonio, but District 123. I grew up on the west side of San Antonio. This district is diverse. It has a little bit of the west side, a little bit of the east side, the downtown area, and north central. I feel I know the district because this is where I grew up, and this is what the district that I've been passionate about in serving in public office. I served on the city council for eight years, and while there, uh, addressed many of the issues that were important and continue to be important today. We initiated, initiated the first program to promote uh, small minority women-owned businesses and to, to pass an ordinance to set that up for the future and to, to give opportunity to small businesses. Uh, I was active in uh, affordable housing, not only in the City Council Task Force, but also in the private sector. For the last 20 years, I've worked in developing affordable housing over close to 5,000 units from San Antonio down to South Texas and Brownsville. Uh, back in the 70s, when it was important to begin to get a voice and address the needs of our community that weren't being addressed, we were active in initiating nonprofit organizations like Avenida Guadalupe to address economic development, to create jobs, to bring uh, investment, uh, working with cops and other organizations, for example, uh, community organizations. Areas of San Antonio that had never received benefits, basic benefits, streets and drainage, were able to be, uh, we were able to be successful in securing th that support. So with that background, both working in the public sector at the state level, in, in the state legislature, having worked up there for 10 years uh, and served one term, as well as a local level, and then also the business or the perspective that I bring as a businessman, having been involved in business for over 20 years here in San Antonio. That's the qualifications I bring to this office. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Nunzio Prevatero, and I want to thank all of you for having this and hosting this, this great setting. Uh, there's, as all you know, this election is going to be whirlwind. It's during the holidays, most people are, are more concerned with having Christmas and New Year's. Um, but, but where am I from? My, I am a proud Air Force brat. My father served in World War II and Vietnam. His career spanned both of them. As I was growing up as an Air Force brat, uh, we learned real quick that you didn't have bullies in your atmosphere. Our parents did not allow stuff like that. So I got a work ethic that, that is beyond compare from my parents and from the military people that were around me. The last uh, 20 years, I've been a small business owner together with my wife, Penny. We own an independent insurance agency. And one of the main focuses on that business is we do not only business insurance for small companies, but we do health insurance for individuals and for small businesses. I'm one of those crazy people, and it can't be said in Washington, that actually read the 2,600-page bill of Obamacare. And uh, there was a lot of stuff in that bill that's not helping America, I can assure you. I think we all know that. Um, the other thing that I bring to this table is the, I'm a deacon in the Castle Hills Christian Church, over in, uh, which is in the, within the district. My business is within the district. My wife and I have lived in the district now for a year, but we've lived in San Antonio uh, for the last uh, 30 plus years. We know what it means to write paychecks for individuals and to support families. We know what it means to provide good work atmosphere. We know what it means to train people for jobs. That's what this district needs. This district has a 24% uh, high school dropout rate. So when we talk about education, it's not only what we can do for education in the schools, but what can we do for those students to give them a better life and opportunity on ways to earn deals. We will talk more about that, I think, as we get some of the questions. Uh, I'm also the only Republican. Uh, in a legislature that is going to be manned by the Republicans. So I'm going to have the ability, the best ability of everybody you see up here, to take our district issues to Austin and get them passed. 
Thank you. Our next question. Our next question starts with Councilman Bernal. Uh, if elected at the state level, what will you accomplish for San Antonio and Bear County? Uh, thank you. Also, um, this is not a diva moment. I'm a little under the weather, and so they they brought me a sprite. So I'm not feeling so well. I think we have to look at that question two ways. Uh, one, I'm a Democrat, and I'm a proud Democrat. That means that I have an agenda to some degree that might be contrary to the Republican agenda. That being said, working across the aisle is a prerequisite. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, you have to do that in order to get things done. So I think there are common sense things that we can do. For example, and you mentioned it, um, we have to prepare people for the next generation of jobs here. And I've done quite a bit on council to fortify small businesses. I'll give you an example. As we start to reinvest in the inner city, the businesses along those streets are going to suffer as we start to tear up those streets. We've ignored the inner city for a long time. In my district, there were businesses that were suffering because of construction. I created a program that allowed them to focus on payroll and rent. The city took care of their utilities so they could survive. Once the construction was over with, they're able to then stay on their feet and pay the city back. We should have programs like that throughout the state that help small businesses survive construction and infrastructure projects. At the same time though, and I want to be very honest with you guys, there are some bills coming out of Austin that frighten me. And part of my job is to play good defense. Uh, we, 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 we've seen them over and over again. There are some bills that are bad for people. They're bad for working families. They're bad for immigrants. They're bad for students. Uh, they're bad for people from vulnerable communities. And part of our job is going to be to play defense to make sure they don't pass. I think that uh, me in particular have a dual purpose in the legislature. Question. I'm representing the people of District 123. I want to be a champion for developing policies to address the problem of climate change. Uh, climate change is a catastrophe that's unfolding in real time. We need to develop policies to address this. Now, many people, when they read about climate change or they talk about climate change, they think, well, what does that have to do with me and, and my problems in our district? Well, I spoke with a woman just before we met today. And she said she's worried about flooding. She's worried about flooding at her house on Barber Street here in District 123. What causes flooding? Well, there are two things that come to mind immediately. One is the increase in impermeable ground cover that's caused by development. And if we approve projects like the Vista Ridge water pipeline, we're going to have more development. We're going to have more impermeable ground cover. We're going to have more flooding. What else drives flooding? Uh, climate change drives flooding. As we pump more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're going to have more 100 year floods. When we start having 500 year floods in 10 years, we know we have a problem, right? Uh, what can San Antonio do to address this? San Antonio is the host to the Southwest Research Institute, one of the largest institutes in the country, pioneering new technologies in transportation. San Antonio is also the host to Brook City Base, where they are developing new solar technologies. San Antonio can play a leading role in the transformation of the technologies we need to address the problem of climate change. Uh, we can put a little green dot in the middle of this sea of red in the state of Texas if you vote for me. Thank you. Those are very good issues. Um, you know, the issues that confront us and, as a community are varied. And I think uh, the representative that's elected needs to make sure that he or, he or she listens to the voters listens to the, the citizens. Um, you need to have an open door policy. Uh, you can't be, you can't have an arrogant attitude that says, you know, I know it all, I'm smarter, and I, I know what you want. Uh, you need to be able to say to the people uh, and be genuine about it, uh, that you want to represent them and what their concerns are. Uh, there's people, there's, uh, we have uh, citizens in our community, for example, that are concerned about uh, tax relief. And I know that that's probably one of the topics that's going to be addressed in the legislature. But in terms of tax relief, who really needs the help? It's the homeowner. It's a, it's the residents that are suffering from higher tax bills. And uh, and you know there will be tax bills that are introduced in the legislature that might offer uh, benefits to the the big tax uh, payers, the the big uh, businesses. And, and while business needs to be encouraged here in Texas to be, to be able to create jobs, 
and, and have a, a strong economy, we also have to look at who's carrying the burden of that tax. One of the things that I want to explore, uh, and previous, uh, the previous representative here, Mike Garriala, attempted this and wasn't able to do it, but we need to set a sunset uh, bill, we need sunset legislation on tax exemptions. Some of these exemptions were passed 10 and 20 years ago. They've never been reviewed by the legislature. Are they still essential? Are they still, uh, uh, you know, necessary? Uh, why is that important? That's $41 billion a year that's lost in money, in revenue, that could be used to address uh, education. I have two daughters in the audience here, Anna and Isa, and they're probably embarrassed that I introduced them. But they're, 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 they are teenagers that attend public school here. I attended public school here. We need to make sure that we support our public schools and I am concerned about not only the kids that are in public schools that are doing well, but also those that are not doing well. You know, back in the old day, it used to be that we would warehouse the kids that were the bad kids. And what, do we, what, what, what did that produce? It produced kids that are not prepared for jobs and that are, that are a drag in the economy. We need to make sure that those programs for GED and other programs that, that, uh, that rescue those kids are available and that they're important and a funding uh, mechanism exists at the state level for those programs. Those are some very good points, Walter. You know, one of the other segments of, of this district that has gone overlooked completely, 24% of the population in House District 123 are senior citizens. The majority of them own their own homes. We cannot forget our senior citizens. We cannot continue to increase property taxes. Matter of fact, we need to be lowering property taxes for those people. Yep. That's gonna be a very big pushing point. Most of the working people in House District 123 are employed by small, locally owned businesses. They're not employed by the big businesses. They're not employed by the government. There's no military within this district. It's small businesses. We need to focus on helping small businesses. We need to pass legislation that takes away the mandates and the administrative burdens that we're putting on small businesses. We need to do things like that. We need to form work, uh, work programs that encourage them. I work real close with masonry contractors. I work real close with electrical contractors and air conditioning contractors. And what I hear from all of those small business owners in this town is they can't find qualified workers. And that's because there's no programs. The schools don't teach them. There's no real programs out there focused. Our magnet schools do a little bit on some of the industries, but we need to expand that. And we need to be working not just with the schools, but with the associations to get very specific on job skills and helping our people. Um, the city of San Antonio, you know, I've, I've been hearing about Vista Ridge and I think that's important. I think we have a question about that coming up. Uh, but one of the real, real important things is, I don't know about you guys, but if, I, if you read the paper in the last couple of months, supposedly the flooding issue around Almost Creek is already taken care of. And I, we just heard today that it's not. There's houses being boarded up along there. We need to get involved in that area and work close with them. It's an opportunity to help the people in the district. And my qualifications, working with the Republican Party and the Republican leaderships, will make sure that those things get heard. The last thing that I'll throw out with regards to that is small business access to health care. Group health care and individual health care, while Obamacare did some good things, the few good things that came out of it could have been done with a five-page bill. Just simply five pages would have taken care of a few things. We need to come back. What a lot of people, I'll come back to them. Well, I think um, communication is going to be key on a lot of different levels. Uh, first of all, that's what I do for a living. I'm 
used to going out and talking with different stakeholders, different people in the community, uh, different people in different organizations, and, and building consensus. Um, now, with that in mind, uh, going into the state legislature in this, uh, this capacity now, there's obviously going to be some times for consensus building, but there's going to be some times where we're going to need to just roll up our sleeves and, and, and fight for the causes that are important to us. Uh, the things that I am, I am bringing to the table have to do with education, quality education, good jobs, and equal opportunities for all Texans. So when it comes to education, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say for sure one of the most important things is to make sure that all children have access to pre-K, um, and that's full-time access to pre-K. That's extremely important. We all know that uh, Children learn a lot in their early years, and they can succeed more if they have access to that. Um, my parents are graduates of Fox Tech High School here in San Antonio. Um, I was born in this district, and I uh, lived here until we moved away to Corpus. And I have been here ever since, living uh, for almost 20 years in this district now, and attended, as I mentioned, UTSA. But uh, they weren't able to put me through college. I had to uh, find my own way, and I had to work uh, all the way through college as well. And so higher education and access to higher education is extremely important to me. And um, I want to make sure that anybody that would like to go to college uh, has that opportunity. Um, with that being said, you know, there needs to be some, some education as well on other skills and trades, which goes into my next thing, which is jobs. So we have a lot of uh, 21st century jobs here in San Antonio. We're creating more, obviously, with some of these uh, you know, new big businesses like Toyota has been here for a while. Um, we're talking about other things in, in uh, different fields, but uh, we need to make sure that those skills and trades are learned here as well and that the jobs that are provided marry the, those skill sets. So that's extremely important as well. Um, as a small business owner, you know, you all uh, probably or most of you at least have a small business. Over 90% of businesses here in Texas are small businesses. So you know what it's like to work hard every day to put food on your table, to uh, make payroll, to create jobs, to uh, manage people, which that's not always easy to do, no matter how many uh, you're managing. Uh, seniors and veterans are extremely important to me. I want to make sure that uh, seniors have access to quality and affordable health care. I want to make sure that our veterans are taken care of. And I'd like to mention um, my two uncles that are here that are both veterans, Carlos and Hector Pacheco. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> actually, uh, they, they, they are friends with some people here Hi. in the Alamo Chamber, so thank you. All right, our third question starts with Mr. Edmonton. As a state representative for District 123, how will you advocate for Bear County to advance our, tele advance our telecommunications? Um, the, the short answer would be on for net neutrality. I think that net neutrality is an important principle. Uh, it needs to be uh, an important part of our policy at both the state level as well as the federal level. But what we've seen in the telecommunications sector is a proliferation of different uh, information sources for people. We have lots of different channels that are open for people uh, to get information and to learn about their communities and their world and, uh, and make informed decisions. But with this proliferation of resources uh, for use, we have seen a concentration in the, the carriers that provide the, the pipe that the information is uh, made available in. And I think that's a bad thing. We need to uh, be very careful to treat the uh, cable industry and the uh, people that are providing the conduits for information as utilities that are subject to public regulation that are accountable to the people for the way they set rates and for the services they provide. And, uh, those are critical things that need to be considered in the state regulatory uh, process for regulating our communications sector. Okay, I think um, for me, when uh, you think about telecommunications and how to advance it in our community, uh, I think from uh, the standpoint of uh, <coughs> resident and citizens, they want access and they want affordability. Uh, I think any regulation or state uh, statute that would inhibit that would be, uh, would be bad. So my focus would be to make sure that whatever is offered as far as legislation, dealing with telecommunications that we continue to, that we focus on the, the fact that it needs to be accessible 
for all the citizens as broadly as possible. Uh, diversity in, um, in our telecommunications, I think, is a good thing because it gives more um, vehicles, more channels for people to hear, um, to get, to get uh, information. Uh, but it has to be affordable. If you can't afford it, I mean, you know, look at your, uh, look at your monthly ca cable bill. Uh, that's the issue of telecommunications, you know, is it affordable? Uh, how can we make sure that we make it affordable and maintain it affordable and that it, it is also uh, readily available and, and offers diversity and choice for the consumer? Now, ultimately, I want to be there representing the consumer, not the telecom giants that are you know, trying to maximize their bottom dollar. Yeah, business is important and they get, they need, they're in business for a reason, but at the same time, uh, the telecommunication industry and, and that whole topic is almost like, uh, it's like uh, electricity or water. We all need access to it and it has to be affordable. That's the main thing. So the consumer concerns and the consumer input should be foremost in my mind in addressing those issues. My first very short answer is do everything we can to get AT&T to come back to San Antonio. Uh, we, lost a, we lost a great business partner when we lost AT&T to Dallas. Um, you can't sit in a restaurant. Matter of fact, I'm looking out the crowd right now and I see at least five cell phones in hands with fingers punching on. You know, technology is the future. You know, I hear seniors, I'm not going to learn that stuff. And then I see them posting on Facebook pictures of their grandkids. Okay? It's here, folks, and it's going to be here. We have got to, from a legislative standpoint, we've got to embrace it. We've got to do everything we can to work with companies like Google, uh, with AT&T, to make sure that they build the infrastructure for the cyber optic systems that will bring the things that Walter's talking about, uh, the affordability and, and the access to the web to this city. Um, I, I feel the same way. I think it's all about accessibility. Um, now in this day and age, just as you mentioned, uh, you know, we have so many different ways to communicate and it's all about uh, how fast you can do it. I think it almost kind of makes us a little bit ADD because it's like, if they don't respond right away, you get a little nervous because you know, everybody's easily accessible these days. Uh, but more importantly, I think one of the things that I'll be looking at as well is uh, the jobs uh, that, are, that, that uh, this kind of industry will create and that we have the workforce, which I think is all very important to all of us. Uh, so that the, the jobs and the workforce goes hand in hand when it comes to telecommunications. All right. Uh, I'm doing my very best, you guys, to give you specifics because as you can see, a lot of us are going to say that we care about a lot of the same things, and we do. I mean, I think that, in all honesty, you've got a good crop of people here who have big hearts. Um, but on this topic, let me just sort of say three things. First, right now, the city of San Antonio and Bear County are finalists for Google Fiber. And that means two things. One, it means that you would be able to get internet speeds that are 10 times fast, 100 times faster than they are now. That means you can download a full, high definition, Dolby surround sound movie in two minutes. But what Google Fiber also offers is that if you pay a one-time fee of $300, and that can be spread out over years, you could get lifetime high-speed internet. And what that means for areas like the west side, and the east side, and the south side, and parts of our district, is that it bridges the, di the digital divide. We need to make sure there are no legislative barriers to making sure Google Fiber comes here to stay. <clears throat> the second thing is that we have, and we started it about a year and a half ago, it's called the San Antonio Area Broadband Network. Underneath San Antonio is what's called dark fiber. It's, it's fiber that's not being used. Because it was put down and it's owned by the city, we can use it like a public utility. We can connect public institutions, libraries, universities, public hospitals, and we can give them high-speed internet. When I say high-speed, I mean faster than we have now at a very, very low cost. This enhances their ability to do uh, research. It enhances their ability to educate students. And it also enhances their ability to do the work faster. So telecommunications has a lot to do with that. And then finally, remember that it is absolutely our job to bring home 
the bread and butter for San Antonio, but we are also part of a whole to represent the state. And there are rural areas, some of them are just right outside the city limits in Bear County that don't have the same access to towers and cell service and and internet that others do. And so part of our job is to equalize that and make sure it's not done just by one carrier, but several carriers so that they have a diversity of options. And these are specifics that I believe that we can do and are part of my agenda. Thank you. Next question uh, starts with Councilman uh, Martinez. Um, how will you advocate for Bear County to receive state funds for transportation? Yes. Well, uh, that's a very important uh, issue for our community. Um, you know, we we are lagging way behind on investment in our infrastructure, and that's an important component of ensuring that our community and that the state is able to progress and to attract investment and job creation uh, throughout the state. Um, one of the things we need to make sure we do is to make sure that the dollars that are generated through the transportation tax remain part of the uh, funding for transportation. If you look out uh, at the growth areas of San Antonio, out on 1604 in the west, for example, I hate driving out there because you just can't get there. It takes an hour and a half to, to, to just travel one quarter uh, of a mile in 1604. There's uh, access roads and main highways that uh, should have been built 10 years ago because the communities were already uh, uh, coming. So we, we need to make sure that uh, we, we, we fight for those uh, funding dollars for our local community, uh, but also that we don't rate that transportation tax in such a way that uh, we can continue to invest. Right now, we're not even maintaining the highways that we own right now. If you, you know, all of you uh, drive uh, the roads, and there's some that are in ter terrible condition because uh, I think there, we've been lax in, uh, and I, I think negligent in rating those funds and using them for something else. You know, there are some things we need, there are some things we would like to have, but, some, but at a time when austerity is required, when we have limited resources for public services, we need to make sure that our priorities are not out of, out of whack. You know, we may like the Glincy project that we want to put funding to and, and monies to, but you know what? There's also some needs we have we have to address that we haven't been addressing. So I would focus on making sure that we first address those needs that we have in our community that are a must before we start thinking about attractive or Glincy projects that we want to throw money into. Transportation is a very important issue in Bear County. It is not that important an issue in House District 123. 89% of the working people in House District 123 go to work in private vehicles. Okay? They use their own cars. Thanks to the way San Antonio is built, it's almost impossible to, without spending millions and millions of dollars, create any kind of mass transit that would really help House District 123. Now, House District 123 is going to be my emphasis, so I am going to be looking at transportation issues and remembering how they will affect my district, and I'm going to be voting so that it helps my district on these things. The other thing that I'm very concerned about, uh, the streetcar, debacle, not so much the streetcars themselves, but the funding mechanism. We gave the state of Texas $92 million for them to give us back $92 million. What should have been done is we should have asked for a grant from the state for that $92 million because on those transportation grants, when the state issues them, they require that you put up 25% and they fund it by four times. So we shortchanged ourselves by hundreds of millions of dollars by funding the streetcars or planning to fund the streetcars the way we did. That money that is, does remain here, if it had been left in the state and, and done properly, would have brought many, many, many more tax dollars to the city of San Antonio and to our house district. Transportation issues, there's going to be a bill coming up 
that is going to be asking for transportation board type members to lo no longer be appointed. They're going to have to be earning your vote and getting on those boards if the law uh, passes this legislation. I'm all for that. A lot of the appointments are terrible. The last thing that I'll talk about on transportation is toll roads. The state tells you that we can't build without toll roads. That's crazy. We need to quit diverting the money that was, you know, supposed to be used for our highways to other projects so that when we need to build a road, we have it. The other thing is an existing road, there's no way in the world an existing pathway or road should be turned into a toll road. Those few toll roads that we do fund, when that road is paid for, that toll should stop. It doesn't need to be used for other things. We have a real problem with truth and taxation in this state. We get a tax and then we use it for pet projects. That has to stop. Obviously, transportation is going to be a very big issue in the upcoming uh, legislative session. Uh, I'm also of the school of thought that we should not toll uh, existing roads, and I'm also of the thought that if uh, if that is something that the city of San Antonio decides to do, it would definitely be done uh, as a vote through the people. And so that that is where I stand on that issue. But with that being said. Uh, there's a lot of things that we need to be looking at currently, uh, specifically in District 123, that will allow um, multimodal transportation and looking at how we can um, get, get cars off the streets and use our bus system, use, um, have more bike lanes, different things like that, and it also will hopefully uh, reduce some of the air pollution and, and help in that capacity as well. And so those are the things that I'll be bringing forward uh, for District 123 regarding transportation. Uh, specifically, we have what are called ATD dollars that we can use to improve the roads, but I, I think that, that I agree that the state has been negligent in the way that it spends some of its transportation money. And I'll give you an example. You may remember a few months ago that the state tried to unload certain streets that are in our city but are maintained by the state and said, look, city of San Antonio, these are your problems now. Uh, you've got to fund them. You've got to take care of them. You've got to, you're responsible for the maintenance of them. That's negligence. And so we need to make sure that, as other folks have said, that money be, is being spent correctly and prioritized. I will actually, though, disagree with one of my panelists on transportation not being a big issue in this district. One of the things that's happening in 123 is that we are seeing a renaissance of the inner city. We're seeing a renaissance of our downtown. We are seeing an influx, not only of young people, but of jobs, especially jobs based on the tech industry and the cloud in particular. Those people, those young people who are looking for a place, they're trying to decide between moving to Los Angeles and Atlanta and San Antonio and New York. And one of the things that they ask for all of the time are other ways to get around aside from using their car. They do want a bus system that gets them around the entire city. They do want more bike lanes. They do want more walkability, right? In fact, to that end, when it comes to seniors, they want walkability that allows everyone to participate. So if you're in a walker or a wheelchair, they want it all. And so part of bringing jobs, part of bringing industry is making sure that we have an active, multimodal transportation system. So the fact that it's not an issue, I think, betrays not only a personal, but a, a financial interest that the district has. I also believe that it's important that we look to transportation as a way to generate money. It's not just about big projects, it's about what will those projects produce. One of the really great things about the conversation that we had a few months ago with regard to rail is that all of a sudden we're having a conversation again about connecting San Antonio to Austin and Dallas and Houston and Corpus and the Valley. That, and I, and I guarantee that downtown, the prime part of the, the central business district of the city will be a part of that plan. That has to be part of the state's future. So uh, transportation on a local level and transportation on a state level go hand in hand to making sure that this district and the state evolves properly. Okay, well,
Transportation is a critical issue for the citizens of District 123. <coughs> if you look at the data on how many people use public transportation to get to work, it's much higher in our district than it is statewide. And it would be higher, it would be much higher still if we had decent public transportation. Anybody that's tried to get from one place to another in San Antonio on the bus knows exactly what I'm talking about. We need to improve our transportation infrastructure. And we need to do that. We need to find the funds to do that with. Uh, one way, one thing that the legislature has to consider very seriously is looking at the way the gas tax is computed. We base the gas tax on the number of uh, uh, per gallon. But what's happened, of course, with the cafe standards and the improvements in mileage over the years, we have a decreasing pool of money to fund the infrastructure on an increasing number of vehicles. This leads to disaster. This leads to bridges crumbling and, uh, and, and also it leads to great losses in productivity because people are taking longer to get to work. This is, this is a recipe for, uh, for regress rather than progress. We need to develop a funding formula that's based on miles of transportation use rather than gallons of fuel. We need to fund public transportation uh, aggressively. We don't need to lower this, but we need to invest in public <coughs> infrastructure. When I fly to Dallas, I can take a light rail system uh, from the airport to downtown in 20 minutes. Try to do that in San Antonio, it's impossible. San Antonio is the only city in this state that does not have light rail. We need to invest in light rail, we need to fund it for the change in the way we contribute to gas. <coughs> we can do these things. We also need to look at moving the freight rail system outside of the city. Uh, this will greatly improve safety for the residents of District 123, as well as waiting times when they're standing there waiting for a freight train to go by. Uh, there, there are proposals in, in the legislature now to look at ways to move the freight hubs outside the city and take those existing rail links and use them for public transportation infrastructure. We can do these things. We can find the money to do it, and making those changes is critical to the continued development of District 123. Thank you. Our next question starts with Ms. Kudamira. What is your stance on renewable energy? Renewable energy is important to all of us. The problem with most renewable energy is that the only way it's coming to fruition is by the government continuing to raise taxes to pay for it. We see time and time again the private industries not investing in renewable en energy. Why is that? It's too expensive. They're not going to spend money on it. We worry about climate control. We worry about a lot of reasons for renewable energy. Um, when we, and I mean we by our scientists and the people in this country that know how to do those kinds of things, actually come along and figure out a way to do it cheaply, I think we should do it. Until we get there, I do not believe we should continue to fund renewable energy. I think renewable energy is extremely important. I think um, being being green is important and, and uh, recycling where we can in different capacities. Uh, but most importantly, uh, you know, the way that we do business now, there's a, a lot more need, um, obviously, for energy uh, just on a daily basis uh, as a private citizen or as a business owner or wherever you work. So I think anytime there's any opportunities uh, to implement renewable energy, uh, whether it's private sector or public sector, I think that's extremely important and I'll be taking a, a good look at that and how it'll affect District 123 and what we can do uh, to, to bring more of that to uh, the state legislature. I see renewable energy, energy as both uh, an opportunity and responsibility. It's responsibility because we can't continue to be reliant on non-renewable energy. And it's the, only, it's the only sort of energy producer that does a number of things. One, it leads us into the next century in terms of jobs. The, the new wave of jobs are going to be jobs that focus on renewable energy. That also has a connection 
with education. If we can create a pipeline so people can get trained to work on it, then renewable energy creates uh, a market and a pipeline for education to fill that need. The next thing it does is, look, we've heard about oil pipe prices dropping, and we've heard about, while the great boom of the Eagle Ford Shale is important, we're starting to hear rumblings or maybe some anxieties about it not lasting, that the bottom is going to fall out soon. Renewable energy doesn't have that. It doesn't have that collateral damage. It doesn't have those consequences. It's something that's stable. And so while it may be we have to figure out how to control the cost of it in the long run, it's an investment. If you look at it just for the first year or two, it might seem like it's a little high, but in the long run it pays off. And it doesn't have the collateral damage of decimating a city, polluting the environment, or leaving people unemployed the way that other energies do. So it's certainly worthy of our time and attention. Uh, I think it's absolutely the responsibility of the state, especially because we're a coastal state. It is, it is absolutely our responsibility to make sure that we invest in and promote, train, and educate people for the new energy economy of which renewable energy is part of. Uh, renewable energy is critical to answering the dilemma posed by climate change. Uh, if you look at the projections for when we're going to hit a 2% increase in the CO2 levels, it's on the order between 25 and 30 years. That means your children and grandchildren are going to be growing up in an environment that's radically different from the one we live in, unless we make changes and we start making those changes now. And renewable energy is the key to doing that. How are we going to fund these things? Well, I disagree vehemently with the Republican position about uh, that this is not economically feasible. It's very economically feasible. What we need to do is stop uh, underwriting the cost of fossil fuels. How many of you pay a water bill? Raise your hands. Anybody pay a water bill? When you look at your water bill, you'll see a bill for water going in, right? And then you see what else? A bill for water going out, wastewater, right? And that wastewater bill, that can be higher than the water coming in, right? Am I right? All right. When you uh, consume a gallon of fossil fuel, we're, who's paying the bill for the, the carbon dioxide going out? Do you see that on your bill? You don't see that on your bill. We need to start sending that bill to the oil and gas companies. They are, you, they are being subsidized, in effect. They're not paying for the waste that's being generated. We need to find a way to recover those costs. When we do that, solar will become extremely economically viable. It already is economically viable. If you go out to Marfa, Texas, you're going to see a solar plant that's being developed by private money. Where's that private money from? It's from France. I told this to somebody uh, the other day, a, a good Texas capitalist, and he said, I hate the French. Why aren't we investing in solar energy in Marfa? Why aren't we? Well, there are resources like that that are going to be getting public, or are going to be getting not public capital, but private capital, uh, and people are investing in it. T. Boone Pickens, when he stopped investing in oil, was, what did he invest in? He invested in wind energy. This is an economically viable thing. Investing in the transfer of technologies to bring renewable energy here is a critical part of the Flint Makers future. Uh, we can make those changes right here. We have uh, Brook City Base, which is leading development in social technology. We have the Southwest Research, Research Institute, which is one of the largest research institutes in the country, where they're doing all sorts of things, developing uh, new approaches to transportation that are going to be more energy efficient. We can make those changes here. We can lead the way in the transport of technologies in renewable energy here in District 23. I, I, uh, I support uh, efforts to uh, address renewable energy, uh, similar to my colleagues up here. Um, I think uh, state government has a role. One of the roles, uh, I think one of the areas where state government can help is providing incentives working with the private sector and trying to uh, change attitudes and trying to offer incentives where uh, we can do more in, in that area. Uh, as we continue to, uh, uh, as we continue to uh, advance with research, there's going to be more opportunity for renewable energy in the future. Uh, an important component of this is uh, conservation. There's a lot of areas where if we just bring in conservation in our lives, uh, we can save a lot. 
so that you, you can consume less energy. <coughs> I was having a discussion this morning with, with a cup of coffee with a gentleman who offers a lighting system that can uh, work on a building such as this or an apartment building and save 63% of the energy that is consumed by that building. We, we have to uh, look for those opportunities where we can not only look at how do we produce energy that is not uh, dependent on fossil fuel, but also where can we conserve? Uh, what are areas that we can conserve so that we don't have to use as much energy? And I think, I think the legislature plays a role in that area by offering incentives as well as disincentives uh, in some areas where it's needed uh, so that we don't waste energy. So I would be supportive of that type of uh, legislation uh, and, and making sure that we can continue to move forward in, in the area of uh, renewable energy. I'll start by Thalco with this idea on with the next question. How will you ensure that the residents of Bear County continue to protect the Edwards Aquifer and maintain low water rates? Well, uh, the, the water rates, I believe, are approved by city council. So as far as uh, the state legislature and things that we can do uh, to, to help with this, with, uh, first of all, B, I know we have a uh, one-eighth cent sales tax that goes uh, to purchases of uh, land over the, over the uh, aquifer recharge zone. Um, and that is passed every five years. Uh, maybe looking into that bill and passing it um, maybe every eight or ten years instead of that, that would be important. And also just taking care of our natural resources. We need uh, so much water now uh, in our private lives and in businesses and we need to have access uh, to water and we need to make sure it's affordable for everyone and those will be the priorities for me. Okay, well, um, there's, there's two things. First is, even with the, the new water deal, we still pay among the lowest rates in the state. But that being said, right now, what no one's talking about is there's a committee that's meeting that's deciding on the rate structure, right? Who's going to pay what based on how much water they use? And I've advocated for what's called a lifeline, saying if you use up to a certain amount, you pay a flat rate, and that protects your citizens, it protects people on a fixed income. And I think that you know one of the things that was hard on council was that sometimes council and the county and the state government and the federal government worked independently of one another. And these are opportunities where we should work together to make sure that that rate structure committee <clears throat> comes out with something that protects the most vulnerable people with, with regard to water use. The second thing is, and Ms. Aguillon touched on it, I believe that when it's time to renew that eighth of a cent, there's actually two parts, Prop 1 and Prop 2, that we extend it for twice as long as it's been now, but we cut it in half. Or it could be two-thirds and one-third. But one part of it goes to continue to buy land over the aquifer to make sure that the recharge zone is protected, but the other half goes to supply. Because we're always talking about water supply, we've just finished a big water supply deal. If some of that money can go to supply, that's where rate payers will realize a real benefit. In other words, if we can use some of that money for supply over the next 10 years, then your bill would actually be lower than if we didn't use that money that way, and that's voter approved. So I think that while those might be city or countywide things, it's incumbent upon us as fellow elected people to work together with the local government to help them get that passed. Uh, when I was on council before I even considered leaving, this is one of the things that I was suggesting. Now it's, you know, there's a lot of research that has to be done we have to get the numbers right, but there is an opportunity to continue to do conservation, to protect the officer, to keep our rates low, to make sure that the rate structure is done in the right way, but at the same time, maybe we can use some of that tax to go to supply, and that's where rate payers will realize a very real savings, and we should work together on that. Import water from Burleson County to San Antonio. This is a multi-billion dollar investment that they're making with rate payers' money. Uh, uh, Councilman Bernal was instrumental in passing that legislation, and he's just told you that he still hasn't decided how we're going to pay for that. The rates are so I didn't say that. I did not say that. I did not say that. Let me, let me try to, maybe I can correct him. He, has, nice. said, he has said that, that the question of how these rates are going to be set is still up for every debate. Okay? So he's asking, he, he's already appropriated the money for the pipeline, and now he's saying, Hey, let's have a discussion about how rate payers are going to pay for it. Now, 
I don't think that's a particularly good idea. Uh, it is important to, if we are going to have projects like Vista Ridge, any projects like that have to be paid for by the developers that are going to benefit from it, not by the rate payers. That is principle number one, and that's going to be my number one principle. Now, how are we going to ensure an adequate water supply for the people of San Antonio that are paying the rates right now? We need to do things to improve uh, features like biofiltration features that capture storm water. Up until this point, we have treated storm water like it's a contaminant, like it's a problem. We need to take storm water and convert that into a resource that's going to replenish the aquifer. <laughs> we have the technologies to do that. We have uh, biofiltration that can capture uh, in small catchment areas, ca capture runoff, and divert it back into the aquifer. This can maintain aquifer levels without boondoggle pipelines that are going to line developers' pockets. Those are the kinds of projects we do need to invest in. To keep rates low and to keep water clean, we need to avoid development that's going to increase impermeable ground cover, that's going to increase problems with storm runoff. And we need to develop those features such as biofiltration that are going to recapture storm runoff. And by all means, we're not going to send a bill to rate payers in order to do that. Thank you. <laughs> I guess the moral of the story is that when the, when the water purveyors roll into town, <coughs> hang on to your wallet. Uh, you know, it's just an important issue. Uh, we need to have a sufficient, uh, a sufficient water source, and San Antonio has wrestled with and has worked hard to make sure that the aquifer is protected. I remember sitting on city council back, you know, years ago, 20 years ago, when the debate was uh, building over the aquifer, and there was restriction, that there was issues that we were addressing back then. Uh, it's, it's a continuing issue that we need to be concerned about. I think the, uh, the legislature has a role in adopting a statewide water plan, in looking at uh, opportunities for diversifying uh, our water source uh, uh, sources for a, community, a growing community like San Antonio. And uh, I would be supportive of those efforts. But again, with the, with the keeping in mind of uh, you know, the old adage that cops would, would lay upon us, who benefits and who pays? If the benefit is for the consumer, then you know who's going to pay for it, and and how do if, if if the developers are benefiting out of it, who's going to pay their share also? So I, that's that would be my uh, outlook on that. We need to continue to to look at diversified uh, opportunities for uh, providing water, protecting the aquifer, and also conserving I mean, some of the programs that uh, the gentleman here mentioned. While the aquifer is, is uh, the Edwards Aquifer is a, an important problem to us here, water is a more important problem to the whole state of Texas. It's not just this area that's been in a drought for the last several years. Most of Texas has been in a drought. I hear uh, time and time again from economic development folks that, that have gone even to Europe, and they come back and they say, they were talking to people in France or in Spain, England, and the biggest question they get is, I hear you guys are having a drought there. You know, we have a water problem, and everybody knows it. If we had solved that problem already, we wouldn't have to be talking about the Edwards Aquifer. How do we solve that? I can tell you right now that the Republican leadership in the state of Texas is working very, very hard on that problem. They've got a lot of ideas. It's not just San Antonio, it's statewide. One of the things that, that none of my panelists here mentioned uh, that, that's a good idea that's, that's being looked into is uh, desalinization plants. Uh, that seems to be uh, Representative Lyle Larson, who is just north of us in, in this district, uh, is very learned on this uh, subject. He's one of the leaders in the subject, and he is doing everything he can to find the water and find ways to do the water. Um, there's not just that problem, it's a big problem. We need to address it, we need to put our resources to addressing it, and the reason it is, is San Antonio is growing like crazy. San Antonio is going to continue to grow like crazy. We have a great city in San Antonio, and 
People are coming from all over the country every month. It is going to really take solving the water problem to allow our city to continue to grow, to build jobs. It's, it's not a simple deal because if it was simple, they would have already solved it. Um, it's going to take everybody in the legislature working together to come up with ideas. There's no one answer to that. Well, the, the portion that uh, the questions that are asked by the panel is concluded. I want to thank the candidates for doing a great job on keeping us on track and staying within the line. And now we're going to throw it out to the audience and uh, take questions. Uh, a few questions from the audience, and we'll have the first question directed toward uh, Councilman Burnell. So, questions from the audience? I just want yes. to make a statement. The District 1, I am one of the Indian Indian descendants that go with Teca Nation for the World Heritage. And District 1 have destroyed one of, this is a colonial city. This is the difference between Dallas, Houston, and Austin. This city was built in 1700 by our Indian churches. And District 1 destroyed one of the oldest history of the Mexican-American and Indian history, the Solis House and Hemisphere Park. The Acequia Madre has been destroyed. The Acequia Madre is 300 years old. And the potholes in this District 1 are unbelievable. They can make potholes in a 300-year-old Acequia and destroy the cultural resources that no city in the state of Texas has because this is going to be the world heritage. It's about five missions. And I have a problem because you have to address this about District 1. The Solis House is being destroyed. And that was the most humble dwelling to open the street and to put multi housing there and destroy the archaeological site where we will never have understanding of this history. And I want Mr. Diego Bernal to be persecuted. I have a federal right now investigation with the Justice Department. This is unacceptable. June 2015, this city will be a war heritage. United Nations, living history of five missions that become this city. And like the Apache way, go and dig the water and the desert. Like question? we did it. God bless you. Is there a question? Why Casa Solis was destroyed without the public knowledge? A 200 year landmark was destroyed after Univision. Because Mr. Renat said that Univision was an ugly building. There's no question. Why? I mean, point of order, Mr. Moderator, please make sure that you say ask a question. Um, no testimony, please. Thank you. Thank you. Can we, right. can we now have a question? Thank you. I'll take the question. <laughs> Aren't you going to answer what the question about the instruction of the site down in the town? So the question is about. Hemisphere Park. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. We understand it now. Thank you. Mr. Bernal, the question to you is about Hemisphere Park. Yes, okay. So if we're going to talk about this, number one, do I support what's happening at Hemisphere Park? Yes, I do. Number two, those issues were raised right when they came to council. We sent all the information that was provided. I'm talking about binders and binders off to the federal authority to make sure that what we're being accused of, whether it was accurate or not. And the federal authorities, including the BIA, have come back and said, it's all right. What you're doing is okay. Proceed. So, you know, I didn't pretend to be an expert when I got in. I was very sensitive to what we were being accused of. I wanted to make sure we weren't doing anything that was disruptive or disrespectful or disgraceful. We sent it to as many different experts as we could. They all came back with the same answer. At this point, they're not taking the complaints anymore because they're saying to us now, we've answered this four or five times. So that gave me the confidence to proceed. I wouldn't actively, no one here would actively try to disrespect or disgrace something that belongs to somebody. That's ludicrous. 
So we took care of it. It's a done deal. Any open direct, any open records request you want to file, we'll verify that. I'm happy to stand behind you. Happy to do so. Yes. We're all involved. We're going to get to a loud response. Okay. 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 So, I hear your concerns, and there are a couple of things I would like you to consider. One, this abuse can be cured. It can't be cured at this point, but it could have been prevented by transparency in government. And that's an important part of my agenda. Ma'am, please. Number two, number two. Uh, my colleague to the left, Mr. Pipetera, said San Antonio is growing like crazy. Do you want, want crazy growth? You cannot touch me. I will call the We need our You have the man, you, have the, you are allowed to speak. Ma'am, you are allowed to speak. Please allow them to answer. Please allow them to answer. That's never happened here. They went and they placed the man out. Enough. My colleague said San Antonio is growing like crazy. If you want crazy growth, vote Republican. If you want sustainable growth, vote Green. Thank you. <laughs> you know, my only response is that I think those issues are legitimate. Uh, they need to be addressed, and I think anytime we make any do any project. Uh, I don't think we should do it in, in haste. Recently, you saw that the state of Texas was stopped in a major, uh, the building of a major construction um, highway and bridge over 1604 because there were some issues raised, not not mainly with historical or cultural uh, artifacts, but uh, with the environmental. So I think that when we when we devote ourselves to do a project, we got to make sure we do it and methodically, and it's done in a way that uh, the law requires. Uh, and with respect to all of those issues. You know, I lived in, in Turkey for three years when I was growing up. And one of my very main life lessons was learned there when I lived in a country that spoke a different language, that every single person that, that we met uh, was from a different culture. A life lesson that I learned was respect others. Treat others the way you want to be respected, and you will be treated well. Respect, cordiality, and transparency are the things that need to be done when you have issues like this. I will very honestly say that I'm not as familiar as Diego was on this. He was on the council at the time this came up. Um, there are other issues like that. The only way that they can be handled is, again, with transparency. Now, I must take exception with my esteemed panelists here. Uh, for some reason, the Democratic leaders in this city that, that did this, all of a sudden, it's the Republicans that, that are the cause of it. I'm sorry, the Republicans didn't have anything to do with this. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? Any additional questions that uh, we want to put to the panel? Yes, ma'am. My name is Grace Hernandez. I'm the Texas Vice Chairwoman for the Mexican American Democrats of Texas. And I want Put this question out to, to all of y'all. I've been biting my teeth and I've been biting my lips and I've been crossing my arms and, and, and really upset that all these issues you're talking about, all these issues that you are talking about are, are important, but the main issue that I would like to hear is whether you have been reading it in the newspaper or not, or just blind yourself to it, there's been domestic violence in the city. And recently, I was part of burying a mother of four children for Christmas. I am a grandmother of five. 
I am very sensitive to any domestic violence. It exists in El Paso, it exists in McAllen, it exists in Laredo, it exists in Garland, all over Texas. I, I spent three months. Can, can, can I have it in a form of a yeah, question, please? Uh, the the question I'm trying to ask is we need a law that is passed. District 123 is fine. We need somebody to pass a law that gives grandparents the rights to help those children that are left behind. There is a lot of red tape yeah, right. yeah, to try to, to get control of, of helping these children and sometimes the fathers or deadbeat dads that are not around to help or, or won't or don't qualify. So the grandparents are overlooked because they're not the biological dad or mom. So your question, I would like to see a law. What would you do to help grandparents' laws to waive all these fees that need to be done to give that grandparent the right to raise that child? Thank you. Wow. That's wow. Well, I'll, I'll start off with one. Okay. Does it matter? Well, the next question was for Mr. Okay. With regard to grandparents' rights, uh, this is in domestic violence. This is a big problem. I recently had the occasion to assist a, a woman who was going to the uh, services for domestic violence here in San Antonio. She presented uh, her case uh, to a, uh, a senator for domestic violence, and they said, "Have you filed a criminal complaint yet?" She said, "No." He said, "Sorry, we can't assist you." Uh, in other words, we have a system designed that isn't going to be there for these women until things really break. We need to change that. We need to have counseling available before the woman gets hit. And we need to have that available readily and accessible to women in these situations. With regard to grandparents' rights, uh, many grandparents are put in a situation uh, where they're going to need to be managing conservatives uh, for children whose parents are no longer able to care for them for reasons of domestic violence, drug abuse, and things like that. But we need to improve funding for legal aid so those grandparents have the resources they need to make the speedy uh, changes in the managing conservatorship of their grandchildren to provide them with an environment of care so these children don't have to be diverted into foster care. And we can do those things. Those, those are changes in the legal system and funding for legal aid that can address the problems that you're talking about. Thank you. I think the, 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 the question is very legitimate. Uh, we see the problem in our community and really it exists everywhere, no matter where you live. Uh, if you look at the state budget, probably next to uh, education, uh, health and human services is probably the biggest part of, our, of the state budget that, that uh, is funded through state funds. A lot of those health and human services programs to help foster children, to provide assistance for uh, domestic violence, to provide uh, advocacy for programs like, like that are vital to many people in our community. Uh, I would be an advocate for, for that, and I would be an advocate for legislation that, that would uh, respect the rights of uh, grandparents, in this, the case that you're citing, uh, so that, you know, with a focus that it, it should, the main uh, focus for all of us should be the, the kids, the children. Uh, how, what is best for the child? Uh, to have uh, someone from their own family lineage to, to take care of them, or to put them in foster care? Um, you know, so I think those programs are vital. They're an important part of the state budget, and uh, you know, every year we need to make sure that those programs are funded adequately and that the right laws are in place to help the kids. Thank you. My wife and I are grandparents. I'm happy to say that we have six beautiful grandchildren, and. I'm especially proud of my oldest one, who is up at Great Lakes in near Chicago, going through Navy basic training. As I talked about on the military earlier, the family tradition is continuing. And uh, but with that said, I had to throw the plug in for my grandson. Um, this is this is a hard issue. This is a real hard issue. The whole issue of domestic violence. Sex trafficking, there, there are several, as Walter mentioned, there are several areas that, that are in conjunction. I would definitely be an advocate for grandparents 
having an easier way to be involved. At the same token, I would want to make sure that there's vetting done because just because it's a grandparent doesn't always mean that's the best place for the child. You know? With respect though to things like fees and all of this other kind of stuff, that's garbage. We need to take care of these kids and we need to get them in the homes that are best for them. And uh, so I would be an advocate for any kind of legislation that does that. Well, as a daughter, as a mother, as a wife, uh, with kids, I have two children. Benjamin is 10 and uh, Karina is 6. Uh, these issues are very important to me. The, I personally have uh, uh, an aunt that is dealing with issues of, of grandparents' rights, and I understand those and how hard it is for her. Uh, it has to do with a broken family, and so sometimes it's not even... Uh, it's circumstances beyond your control, and I've saw her suffer through some of these things, and, and I know how important that is. I'll definitely be an advocate for that, for all women, for, for their rights, and um, domestic violence is just unacceptable. There's no reason for that in this day and age, and there definitely t needs to be more stringent laws um, and reinforcement as far as um, if things like this are happening. So I will definitely fight for that in our state. And you raise an important point, so I want to give you three different three different answers. The first is that Bear County leads; it's one of the leaders in the state with incidents of domestic violence. So it's a much bigger issue than we've talked about today. And you're right for calling us out on that. Uh, I agree that there should be something to make make it easier for grandparents to get access and a hold of those kids. The fees should be waived. I've considered uh, a tax break for people who adopt, whether that's grandparents getting their grandchildren or other folks. But it seems like if you, if, you, if you have kids, you get a break, if you adopt kids, there's not a special tax for that, especially if you're getting them at 6 or 7 or 8 or 13. And so we should do that to encourage it and make it easier. It also reminds me of a program that the city had called the CRTs, the Crisis Response Team. These are folks that deal with victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and rape, and they're always on the chopping block, and we had to save them over and over again. We need to make sure that we fund programs like that. And there's another thing that I've been thinking about. There's an effort to turn our law enforcement into immigration officers. And I've always pushed back on that because in my neighborhood, most of which is immigrant, if, they, if there's an issue of domestic violence, they're not going to call because they're worried that they're going to get their papers checked instead of getting some help. So I think there's a variety of fronts that we've had, we have to go after uh, domestic abuse on, but absolutely, if there's a tremendous amount of red tape keeping a grandparent, a qualified grandparent, and a capable grandparent from getting their grandchild, especially getting out of a bad situation, we need to eliminate that as quickly as possible. <coughs> You're right, we all needed to be told that because we didn't bring it up ourselves, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our questions from the audience. Uh, each of the candidates will now have three minutes to give closing remarks, and we will start on this side with Mr. Rubitera. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank the panelists. It's been a good discussion, and, and I think Diego mentioned it one time earlier. Um, I think everybody on this panel have good hearts. Uh, I think we all care about our district, and more, most important, we care about our constituents in this district. Um, but why do you need to vote for me? You need to vote for me because I have a relationship with Governor-elect Abbott. I have a relationship with Governor-elect, or Governor-elect, Lieutenant Governor Patrick. I have relationships with Senator Donna Campbell, with Lyle Larson. I'm on the State Republican Executive Committee, and I work with Republicans all over the state of Texas to work on these issues and work on the values. You know, one of the things that, that we're finding in San Antonio, the Republican Party has really been given a definition that does not fit. When you talk to Republicans and you talk about core values and family values, you will find that pretty much everybody in this town shares the same values that Republicans do in the Republican Party. The issue is that a lot of times as was pointed out, 
we get blamed for a lot of stuff. You know, we're the, we're the, we're the evil money mongers. That's not a true statement. We spend a lot more time in this community helping others and serving others. And that's what I will do. I don't know if I said it earlier, but the name Nunzio translates to messenger. In Italian. I am of Italian descent and very proud of it. When I get to Austin, I will be the messenger of the people in House District 123 and carry their issues and I have the ability to make it happen, to bring home the bacon to District 123. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the Alamo Chamber, the Asian Chamber, and the West Chamber. I think this has been a great opportunity to uh, listen to the candidates and to uh, let uh, the people, give the people more information about the candidates. Um, I'm interested in going to Austin to make sure that San Antonio and District 123 is heard in the halls of the state capitol. Um, I think the background, my background and my experience, my accomplishments, not only in the private sector, in the public sector, in the nonprofit arena, uh, having the experience of working with different um, entities, both nonprofit and for profit, in private business, I think that gives me a perspective to be able to reach out and work with my colleagues in the House and the Senate. Um, I know it's a Republican-dominated uh, legislature, but uh, that doesn't mean that we can't work on issues that are common to us, both whether you're Republican or Democrat. Um, the focus ought to be on what is the, what are the needs of the, in the community, what are the needs of the families that we represent. So with that, I just want to ask you for your consideration. Um, this is a quick campaign, and the more we can tell our friends and family, and uh, associates that there is an election during this Christmas season, the better we'll have as far as uh, an election turnout uh, on January 6th. Thank you very much. The voters in District 123 have a unique opportunity. You have six candidates with six very different points of view. Uh, you're going to be able to, there are five of them up here now, there's one. It's a no-show for tonight. There should be six on the ballot. Uh, you've heard from one Republican. The Republicans have not participated in the electoral process in District 123 for 10 years. They've basically written off this district. There are several Democrats that are here that want to represent you. Uh, and they can go to Austin, they can be part of the furniture in Austin, because they're not going to have a voice. They are, at best, as Dean Wilber and I said, they're going to try to play strong defense. Or you could vote for me. Why should you vote for me? There are a couple reasons. One, if you vote for a green candidate for this office, you will make national and international news. And <laughs> <laughs> there are, 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 are 3,300 people that voted for me in November. To those 3,300 people, I ask you to come out to vote like January 6th, and bring a friend. If you do, I will win. <laughs> well, why is that going to be good for District 123? It's going to be good for District 123 because a green vision promotes developing alternative fuel sources and developing clean energy and developing the technologies that come along with it that are going to lead to new jobs and new opportunities for the people of 123. It also involves investing in education and reducing the burden of student debt. These are critical problems that have accumulated over the last 40 years that are putting a huge obstacle to economic and social mobility in our community. If you vote green, you are voting for the future. You're voting for your children's future. This is an opportunity to make a change. We already have climate change. It's time for political change. Vote green in 2015. Before I start, you know, I I want to make clear that, that one of us says, I think we all like each other. When when you're running against other people, it's easy to look at, at their materials or their website or their signs and nitpick one another. But I think we'd all agree that everyone sitting up here is a good person who cares about the community, who doesn't wish the other ill will. I expect the last couple weeks to be clean and fair uh, and stately, and so uh, I appreciate that it's been that way so far. Um, 
That being said, the reason I'm running is because I have the legislature is a policy making body. We're not there to articulate how well we know the issues, we're there to make policy and on the issue of public education, on the issue of small business development, on the issue of job creation and retention, on the issue of dealing with broadband and the internet. I have policy making experience. I have done it before and I want to do more of it. I have a record to run on. I'm not running on who I am. I'm not running on the fact that I've been elected before. I'm running on my background in doing this work. I have a record and a plan. And if you like that record and you believe in the plan, then you should vote for me. You've got some great choices here. Um, but all I can tell you, all I can run on is to say, look, here's what I've done. Here's what I'm capable of doing. Here are the successes that I've had on all fronts. If you want more of that, I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you for your time and thank you guys as well. I'd like to, to thank the Alamo City Chamber for having us tonight, for making this a fair process. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your time and energy. Uh, here we are a couple days before Christmas, and it's a room full of people. Um, you wanted to learn more about who would represent you, so thank you very much for coming out and listening to all of us. Um, I would just like to say about a little, a little bit more about myself for, on a personal level. You know, I'm somebody that is uh, obviously the product of a working class family, a very hard working class family. And um, I didn't know that I was going to be running for state representative. Even uh, last year, if you would have asked me, I wouldn't have uh, said this was something that uh, was, was in my future. But you know what? I didn't know uh, when I started my business five years ago how to do that either. And now I run a very successful business. Uh, knowing how to do, uh, doing what I knew how to do in the public relations field. And I've always been very involved in public affairs and government relations. And um, I'm looking forward to this opportunity to represent working families, uh, much like myself, to represent mothers, much like myself, to represent um, other small business owners, much like you as well. And um, I, I would respectfully ask for your vote. I'm going to work very hard. I'm going to take that same hard work and dedication that I use uh, to finish my degrees, to start my business, and, and now to run as, a, as your next state representative. And I respectfully ask for your vote.